Miller's Crossing premiered a quarter of a century ago, this October. And when it came out, some of the critics just simply didn't get it. Others did. The late, great Richard Corliss, who could turn a phrase better than almost anyone, called it noir with a touch so light the film seems to float on the breeze like a frisbee of a fedora sailing through the forest. Ooh, and you will see that fedora, I might add. It really put the Coen brothers on the cinematic map. It's a great script, beautifully shot by Barry Sonnenfeld with memorable music by Carter Burwell. And the principal players of Gabriel Byrne, Marcia Gay Harden, John Turturro, and the one and only Albert Finney are wonderfully complimented by our special guest, who for my money is one of our most accomplished character actors of any era. Uh, it is such a privilege to have John Polito with us tonight, and please give him a warm Palm Springs welcome. John. That was fantastic. Was Wasn't that fantastic? fantastic? What a fantastic Absolutely. performance. A real trip down memory lane. Yeah. How, how long had it been since you've seen I that? I don't think I've seen it on the screen for uh, maybe, um, I don't know, 18 years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, it holds up. Um, yeah, it was nice to see me that big on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> that first scene is so remarkable, and it just grabs you. Did they have to do that several times? How many, how many takes? I don't that? remember how many takes, but I do know one thing that I remember specifically. We shot it. They were initially going to duplicate, I believe, the opening of The Godfather. They were going to do it in one long shot mm -hmm. with the reveal, almost the way The Godfather, you know, I come up through this country. Right, they were right. going to do it in a long, long shot. Mm -hmm. And we shot that for, I think, a day, and they came mm -hmm. back and said it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. A little higher than that. Oh, really? Yeah. And they came back and said it doesn't work to do it in the long shot. Right. That actually, they were, and I was doing the dialogue. That speech is so beautiful, that opening speech. It just was easy to memorize and just came to me very quickly. But I felt there had to be certain breaks in the music of the speech. Right. And that meant cutting away. So we, we shot it a second day, I remember. Mm -hmm. and I remember, I think, God bless Albert Finney. I'd never worked with him before. And here he is listening to me talk for hours and hours and hours and hours. <laughs> he was sort of like, very good. Pick it up. Pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a little direct. A little direct. Yeah. yeah. Now, originally, uh, the Cone brothers, they wanted you to read for a different part. Well, actually, it's not that even they wanted me to read. What happened was the script came to me in August, exactly, I think around this, 25 years ago, this it would be this year. Wow. And I read the script, and I just immediately assumed that they were going to ask me to read for Johnny Caspar. You were Johnny Caspar. I thought I was, because I understood the role so well. And uh, so I said, great, I'll go in and read for Johnny Caspar. And my agent said, they, are, they don't want to see you for Johnny Caspar. Uh, that's a 50-year-old man, you're 39, and, you know, mm -hmm. they're not going to see. Plus, I always believed, now this may not be true, but I believed, I know the Coen sold me mm -hmm. in salesman, death of a salesman, I was like 155 pounds, and then the movie came out of that, that was in 86, only four years, mm -hmm. three years before, but I'd done a show called Crime Story, which I, when I blew up in weight, part of what I, I like to say it's because of my character, but I was just overindulging. And I blew up and changed, yeah. and that actually made my career go because I went from sort of a regular character guy to turning into one of those figures that I always admired. They look like Warner Brothers actors. Those well, I, you know, I, and, I, and I've said this in the newspaper and on radio and everything, uh, that, you know, the whole Johnny Casper and your, your turn of that, it reminded me of, the Green Streets, the Lorries, the all of Ted the, DeCourses, they're the, all of They're them. the ones that I loved from the time I was a kid. I always went to those performances. Yeah. The, leading, uh, the leading character guys were like Charles Lawton. Exactly. But it was all those other little roles. So anyway, I did not go and read. I wouldn't go read for it. Mm -hmm. uh, because I said, I, uh, they said, well, no, they want you to read for the Dane. And I said, no, no, you, you tell them. You tell them I'm going to read for Johnny Casper. And nobody's going to play Johnny Casper but me. And they mm -hmm. didn't bring me in. And I went off and I did a Miami Vice arc, and I went and was doing a play in uh, Hartford, Connecticut called Other People's Money. And they, I got a call saying, they're going to come back and they are going to read you. Um, so I said, okay. I went back uh, from Connecticut to New York, and I read the beginning part of the, I'm talking about friendship, character, and ethics, up to the first break. And they, they stopped and said, wait a minute, go outside. And I went outside, and, uh, and they said, come back in, and now we're going to read the whole script. 
and they had me read every scene cold. I was only cold, meaning no preparation. Mm -hmm. I only knew the first speech, right. but they wanted to see what I would do with every scene, and, uh, and I got it. All right, and we're so glad that he did. And actually, and the truth is, uh, it, it, it changed my whole career. Though the film was not a success, mm -hmm. uh, and didn't make any money. But, and also somebody just said, you look the same. Well, what, it, <laughs> what it really is, you do. 25 years later. But I think what it is, is it, it, uh, uh, as a character guy, you mm -hmm. want to find the look. If you think of those character guys we were talking about, the Peter, Laurie, all the, we knew them the moment you saw them, they always looked the same. Yeah. And you knew who they were. And for me, I hadn't found in film mm -hmm. a character that was going to peg me, mark me, give me my mark, give me my number. Right. And I had it then. Because Absolutely. of the mustache and the, and, and the, the voice, the grovelly and the... Uh, how, did, how, did, how did the cones work on the set? Were there a lot of takes or... In, in when they, when something, they are very economical, but in this one, because I worked with them, I worked with them four times afterwards, which was much, much easier, quicker road. In this one, I think there was, a, there was an awful lot of discussion about the tone, the mood, but they were, we moved quickly in scenes. I remember that last scene, the blowing up and the uh, beating him in the face scene, really just taking place in about, I would say, four to five hours. It moved very quickly, mm -hmm. uh, which is real surprising. They don't expose complexion. a lot of film. They get no, right they are economical, it. yeah, in terms of that. That was, right. uh, so I would say it was a, it was a rather quickly mm -hmm. made film in New Orleans, which is, I don't know you can tell us New Orleans, which is weird about this film because it's yeah. not, you know it's a city film, but you don't know what city it is. Yeah, the it's only, not Chicago, it's not New yeah. York, it's not Philly. The accents yeah. are strange. It's kind of generic. The generic. only thing you get a sense of is where he tells Verna, you know, I'm going to meet you up at the Palisades. And that gives you a little bit of New Yorkish, but it's not New York. But it's not, it's New, not York. New York. And the accents yeah. are New York. No, they're not. No, they're not. It, it's great. I have no idea what accent I'm using. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the cast, your uh, uh, co-stars, so good, and Marsha Gay Harden, she was just starting out at that point. Marsha's, you know, Marsha's an amazing girl because she started doing films and it wasn't working for her, and she went back to NYU mm -hmm. and got her master's and came out, and then it was the summer after she came out, mm -hmm. her, I believe, after her, her master's, and every girl in New York wanted this role. Because by this time, the Coens, they were getting quite a rep for these strange films that everybody right. wanted it, and she landed it. And mm -hmm. even now, looking at it, it's a very interesting, it's a young girl mm -hmm. performance, it's a wonderful performance. It's, it is, it is wonderful. She's got her Oscar, where's mine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Should have gotten it for that, as far as I'm I wish I was somebody's not um, in the how, how did she, how did she and Gabriel Byrne interact? Well, that was funny. Marsha and I were very, very close because it was her first, and I was a big gushy guy all over. I thought she was the sweetest little thing. Mm -hmm. So we had lots of talks, and she, I remember coming back quite a lot, being very upset about Gabriel's not responding to me. Or Gabriel, I can't get to Gabriel. And I really thought Gabriel was, was doing this for the reason of the role. For the edge. So she couldn't yeah. quite be friends with Gabriel. Mm -hmm. And Gabriel was an amazing guy. I mean, they, between Gabriel and Albert, and you would, mm -hmm. you sat down with these guys, and they would, get, they'd pub talk. You know an Irish tale, when they tell you an Irish tale, it goes on forever, and you're fascinated, <laughs> and you're waiting, and you're fascinated, and that was those guys. But I don't think he reached out much to Marsha, and I thought, and I believe that worked in favor of her performance. Absolutely. By the way, did anyone see the, the dual role that I spoke of at the top? Anybody? Okay. I, I see two hands go up, so I'll share that. When uh, Gabriel Byrne bursts into the powder room, you see a couple frames of a maid crossing herself. That was Albert Finney. <laughs> in drag. In drag, with the makeup going, oh, like that. Yeah. But, yeah, Albert, they, they kept Albert around, so he was, he was having, evidently having some fun uh, with that. But um, he was a master on the set too, a master to watch, and I think his performance is just oh, he's, brilliant. He's there was another one should have been nominated. But, yeah, yeah. And the then, film wasn't that well accepted. Yeah, it was. It really wasn't at the time. It's I, very strange because the New York Times, uh, we opened the New York Film Festival. That means, I mean, three thousand people, one theater, three thousand in the other. Big news: the Coen Brothers. And the New York Times was persnickety about everything. It doesn't quite mm -hmm. work. Good. And Marsha Gay can't wear the costumes. And the Coens, but now they say it's one of the classics. 
<laughs> so I was in a movie, I was in this thing called Gangster Squad, and the Times, the New York Times put it down. So I, I wrote to them. I wrote just I just wrote on my little thing, I said, you know, this happened 25 years ago, and I critics be damned, and it went viral. John Polito defends uh, yeah. but it's because I Good for now, you. now it's a classic, then they really put it down. I, I came out okay on it, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but tough.